Thank you very much, Andrea. So the last talk uh, will be on how to use retrospective data uh, from biobanks and repositories, Professor Luis Marti Bormati from Valencia, Spain. Okay, thanks um, a lot for the presentation and I will try to share with you in these uh, 20 minutes, um, which were also our travels in in this setting on uh, putting proteomics and imaging biomarkers into clinical practice. And we try uh, a slightly different approach on the last years, trying to use uh, large retrospective data from biobanks and imaging uh, repositories. So regarding conflict of interest, well, I have no, no important one. I was co-founder of one um, company that is related to uh, radiomics and imaging biomarkers, but I have no shares. But the main um, conflict of interest is that on the last 20 years, I really thought that imaging biomarkers and radiomics were going to change the way radiology is doing. And now I do understand that uh, we thought we knew how to do it, and we were so proud on what we were doing. And uh, on these last two years, things have changed because there is a huge amount of variability on what we are doing. And I will try to share with you how, how to try to decrease that variability taking into, into consideration what we now know as real world data, I mean, which is what are we doing daily in our clinical practice. So first, uh, let's go into why do we need a computational medical imaging and endpoints, those clinical questions we have to answer. And the uh, reason for that is because people, individuals, they are different, and the diseases, they are also different, and there is a huge heterogeneity between diseases, lesions, organs, and people. And also we have a huge amount of questions to answer with the uh, tools we want to apply uh, by using radiomics, biomarkers, biobanks, uh, data analytics, coming from a predisposition to early detection, characterization, phenotyping, natural history, response to treatment and, and so on. So to do that properly, I mean, if we really want to have an impact in clinical practice, maybe we have to rethink what we are doing. And this is the, uh, the steps most of us are following in our daily practice. We need uh, an idea. I mean, I want to measure whatever biological thing we need is important for us. Then we need to acquire images, prepare them, start image processing, signal analysis, dynamic modeling. At the end, measure what we, those metrics we already uh, saw this morning. Try to do that on a small sample of patients that will be extremely well uh, defined, uh, which is call internal validation with the reference values, take care of the biases, enlarge the amount of patients you are studying, try to have an external validation, and at the end, uh, translate that into clinical practice huh? through the structural report. And we are really willing to have a structural report with automatic tumor volume segmentation, evaluating the so many different habitats or heterogeneous clones you might have there. But in clinical practice, we are not doing this. And we are not doing this because it's extremely difficult, mainly because of variability. I mean, variability is huge. And we have to take care on the technical validation, which means uh, the redundancy of data we already saw this morning, the precision stability of our results. That means repeatability or variability without changes. If we do test, retest, will those metrics change? 
reproducibility, which is variability when we have changes. What happens if we have uh, different machines, uh, different upgrades, different uh, number of detectors, uh, different repetition times or whatever. Maybe those things are not really huge, but they will introduce a, a change on the, re, on the reproducibility of our results. Also, it's extremely important to look for the accuracy of our measurements, which means do we really know the ground truth we are willing to measure? And most of the time, we have to go to phantom studies and which is the gold standard we are using? Is the gold standard pathology? And is pathology really as a stable and reproducible gold standard? So with all these technical validation studies, if we succeed on them, then maybe we have to go to the relevance of our measurements. I mean, that means the impact of the measurements we are doing which means the correlation with the clinical endpoints to be a biomarker, a surrogate marker of whatever we want to measure in clinical practice, like response to therapy or aggressiveness or uh, probability to have metastasis or whatever. And of course, at the end, the impact on healthcare pathways. So uh, variability is huge and our impact is quite low. And let me share with you what we are doing in clinical practice. This is a hepatocellular carcinoma in cirrhotic patients. This is what we do in our hospital. And guess, huh? we, are only, we are only measuring the number of lesions, the size of the lesions, and nothing more. I mean, that's our approach. Huh? Once we know that's an HCC, radiomics, and imaging biomarkers is number and size. And we are something like 10 years doing intravoxel in coherent motion, pharmacokinetic modeling on the, trying to look for the aggressiveness of the tumors, and we didn't succeed on that. I mean, we are not having any impact on clinical practice. Although there is a huge amount of work trying to have an impact on the clinical practice. And for my understanding, the reason for that is because of variability of our results in the real world practice. And that's because we are working with extremely high heterogeneous medical images. I mean, so many different vendors, releases, upgrades, protocols, with, uh, and those things limit our biomarkers approaches in this replication uh, studies. And this is something that although we try to do it quite nice and quite beautiful, uh, it's really a limitation. So do we really have the right answers in oncologic imaging to provide data to have an impact on clinical practice? It's our approach on radiomics and data modeling or signal modeling, uh, biomarkers, imaging biomarkers development, a good one. Why imagine answers to biological questions like those ones we saw from phenotyping, grading, aggressiveness, staging, whatever, uh, are, are not really, uh, do not have a, a real clinical impact in daily practice. And from my, from my understanding, the reason is because again, variability, truth, uncertainty. And that means that for whatever we try to measure, if that is going to be representative of our reality, it must have a relationship with this and ambiguous with the physical or chemical or biological process we are measuring, okay? And uh, we do have to recognize that signal comes from voxels, and those voxels, they have so many different components and properties within them, and they are also reconstructed on so many different ways that it's really hard to get objective measurements from them. Now let's go into certainty and evidence. If we go into 
what is recognized as the best way to perform clinical research today, we have to realize that to have a casual inference of relationships between whatever we measure and the clinical reality, most people, most centers, most journals recognize prospective experimental studies, mainly clinical trials, either non-control or control with control versus interventions without or with randomization of the sample as, as the best evidence. And on the level and grading of evidence, those based on randomized control trials, mainly with meta-analysis, or even heterogeneous prospective comparative studies, those are the best ones. But most of us, we like to work with retrospective data because we have a huge amount of data in our PAX system. We can have repositories of images coming from so many different other hospitals, and it will be much easier to increase the knowledge we do have if we are able to perform high quality clinical research on retrospective clinical data with the data we have that comes from the real world, from those extremely heterogeneous uh, cases we do have in clinical practice. So maybe there is a way to perform high quality retrospective observational studies on a longitudinal base with cohort or case control studies. And the reason for that is because the, let's say, gold standard of clinical research maybe is not universal, the results. Maybe they are not reproducible. Maybe they cannot be validated. Or maybe they might not be relevant on what we are doing. And just to have a view on that, there is a concern on the scientific community on the crisis of reproducibility. And that means, and this is a nice paper on Nature some years ago, that most of the authors that publish in Nature recognize that there is a lack of reproducibility of the results that are being published today on the highest quality journals we do have. And we might think, well, you know, that's not medicine. Huh? That might be psychology, no? I mean, this is chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, medicine, earth, and others. Most of us are within 50 and 60% non-reproducible resource, which is a huge amount if we are going to take decisions based on those prospective trials, okay? So let's go maybe deeper into variability, certainty, and evidence. The first thing to come into mind is that maybe thinking that evidence-based medicine will give us um, all the relevant information to take decisions is not a truth. And we recognize that. And on the scientific community, there is a growing interest to use real world data, the data we use in our daily practice to address those uh, clinical and policy relevant questions that might not be properly answered with clinical trials. Because sometimes clinical trials are not constructed to answer the right clinical question. And this is now the debate between should we use real world data or maybe this research control data, which the pros and cons they do have. Let's see them huh? for prospective studies and research control data. The cons are that they are using a limited size group. They are not huge. There is a huge precise inclusion criteria, so we are sampling a small portion of the universe. They, they are extremely expensive, and there is limited evidence because of this subsampling bias. 
but the good thing is the control and homogeneity of the sample. That's the extremely good thing. Let's go into the prospective studies with real world data. Uh, the good things are maybe data heterogeneity will be more representative of the population we are evaluating every day in our practice. There is a need to control data quality, but we can do that through data scientists, as we saw this morning. And the pros is that the population will be much larger. We will include comorbidities because that's the real life. There is a large temporal window. We will have so many more cases. The cost is much lower. And at the end, we will provide what is called real world evidence. That means evidence that will work in our daily practice. So for these image related scientific studies to obtain casual inference, and the challenges of image related research methods, which are the ones we are doing with this, with the OMIS and imaging biomarkers approaches, we have to define that maybe observational studies with retrospective data will be good for that. We have to have as population-based real-world data, large samples as possible. Whatever we obtain should be universal and general, reproducible and cost-effective. And of course, we have to work on those levels of phenotyping predicting response and uh, surrogate outcomes. And the trouble is that sometimes most of the trials performed on prospective data, they have a small data samples, under sample data, and unreproducible data. So let's go into uh, how to pick up data from real world life. Those are the real world data repository that comes from a, to a central repository coming from, of course, clinical trials, registries, registries from rare diseases, we can go there. We can have open access uh, public uh, biobanks, as we already saw this morning. We can ask our radiological information system or the community radiological information system or the country imaging biobanks to provide that data with sometimes also a structure reports. And of course, we can ask the electronic health records from the hospital information system to give us as uh, the probability to obtain objective data from the real world on a large scale, adequate, complete, organized, and let's say standardized on the way we pick up the data as, as feasible. And to do that, one nice approach is the definition of biobanks and imagine biobanks. That's the paper coming from the uh, ESR. And those repositories, they have a huge amount of data that are available for clinical research and uh, innovation in personalized medicine. There is quality control for sample collections, extraction, and protocols for the uh, protection of the data and the regulatory and legal aspects for that. And we can apply this imaging biobanks so we can recognize them as virtual uh, banks that will help us to identify early biomarkers and imaging uh, surrogates. So these biobanks in our approach, they are expected to evaluate in silico on the computers and validate the impact of the biomarkers we can obtain from those images in silico on the computers uh, to be able for early diagnosis, disease phenotyping, and uh, all those things. So this is the way we manage our um, uh, bioban, our management of image collections, consultation, uh, related cases to external databases like pathology or clinical aspects or genetics, image quality check and benchmarking because at the end, we want to construct the real world evidence. 
And how do we do that? We have to follow the uh, strobe approach for uh, longitudinal studies. And these are retrospective in silico observational studies that will have to eliminate all those confounding effects to allow casual inference. And we do that exactly the same way as prospective studies. I mean, we have to control recruitment, sampling, data collection, reference standard, technical specifications, the units and cutoffs and categories, the number of training and expertise of the observers, and the blindness of what we are doing. And if we do that properly, and we construct the pipeline to evaluate the data before we start the retrospective study, we will be able to have this comparative effectiveness research conducted as a target a trial or a pragmatic trial, which will be able to give us the right answers. But even if we do that, do we have now the right answers with that data coming from the real world? Can the process be further improved? Our approach is that yes, that maybe using artificial intelligence will give us a lower variability and a better reproducibility on the data we take from those biobanks. And the two ways we want to do that is through virtual dissection and virtual biopsy. And let's see what's that. Virtual dissection is the use of uh, convolutional neural networks or forest trees or whatever approach we have from deep learning to extract uh, organs and lesions. And we can do that. This is what we do now on uh, liver imaging to calculate fat, ion, inflammation, and fibrosis. We also want to perform virtual biopsy with artificial intelligence, which is by the use of uh, deep learning or convolutional networks, and this is our approach with the aggressiveness of prostate tumors, we will be able to pick up those regions or those with a signature, meaning a multivariable approach that has learned from handcrafted uh, radiomics and uh, imaging biomarkers. So if we do that, Properly, we will construct these uh, repositories to develop artificial intelligence in clinical practice. And just to summarize, we have a huge amount of heterogeneity in image quality based on vendors, protocols, and updates. We do have continuous technological advances, so forget about image standardization. It will be never feasible. There is a huge amount of, uh, of hardware and software uh, changes. We have to recognize that that standardization will never arrive in the real world data to obtain real world evidence. And maybe the use of deep learning or convolutional neural networks will allow us to learn from that lack of homogeneity to have, let's say, uh, normalized images that will be used to obtain data with lower variability and better reproducibility. That's our approach today. And this retrospective real world data with, of course, a quality as soon as checklist based on the stroke for observational studies will give us the probability to use a huge amount of data, big data, that is behind us to obtain a real world evidence. And this is the last project we are involved now, where we use data coming from biobanks on three main uh, countries in Europe, trying to develop a centralized data repository where we will train by artificial intelligence, uh, radiomics and imaging biomarkers using different models to answer phenotyping, treatment allocation, and patient prognosis in patients with neuroblastoma and diffuse pontine glioma. And we are using deep learning and convolutional neural network on most of those processes. 
And these are the projects we are working with that or with artificial intelligence and oncology. This is the one we are now fighting for and I hope we will be able to, to present some data on that. And this is another one with artificial intelligence in a completely different environment. So I hope the future is not on the standardization and clinical trials only because that's a single center approach is in the right use of uh, retrospective and real world data to obtain real world evidence. Thank you. Um, where is the future? Gathering data or synthesizing data, example via the guns for medical aging use. <laughs> Luis, you kind of almost touched a little bit or. Well, I mean, uh, I think the future is everywhere. No? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very opportunistic <laughs> answer. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, all, all the approaches are uh, good approaches. Uh, and we have, the, the trouble is that we have different answers. And from my point of view, we need to approach really what we are doing in clinical practice to obtain data for clinical practice, trying to, to be as fast as possible on the innovation process. Uh, that's, uh, I think that would be the fast way to have a real clinical impact. Any of the other speakers, Andrea? I don't have any experience with synthesized data. I just have clinical data, so I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question, <laughs> sorry. Um, I believe we don't really need synthesized data. We have so much digital data, we just have to find a way of accessing it. If you, if you look at breast imaging. That's true for breast. That's yeah. true for breast. <laughs> but, but not everything is the amount of data that breast has, actually. So I think synthesizing is valid, but in the right context, I think. So. Yeah, I have to agree with what was said already. I think uh, synthesized data make a lot of sense for numeric data. I'm not so sure about imaging. Uh, so for imaging, I'm not sure that we should use it if, indeed, what you said, we have a huge data set available. Well, apart we don't lose the sight, now we're synthesizing CT from MRI and MRI from CT and from ultrasound. So actually, we are going to be faced with looking at synthesized data, we like it or not. So I think we are, well, no, I think the reality is we prepare, no matter what we're expert on, we have to prepare for all the kinds of reality. I mean, some of the work we're doing is actually reconstructing the images from the raw data so they look completely the same without the need for to worry about homogenization at the end. So. I think the beauty of our community is that we all come from different angles, don't you think? And then we answer various questions. So uh, I think there's one, ah, it's one very interesting question. So excellent talk, compliment to you on, um, uh, uh, on breast. Uh, it raises the question if every AI black box needs to undergo rigorous clinical trial before becoming commercially available. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question, and I don't think you're going to like the answer. I mean, if if you really want to have someone take responsibility what the product is being used for in medicine, you have to have a clinical trial to use it, because if it's a black box, not a human observer can take responsibility for it. So it, at least in medicine, I don't think you get around it. Yeah, I course. just make a comment on that. I mean, obviously, uh, I alluded to a tool that has been given FDA approval with relatively small retrospective data set testing. And uh, I think one, one quote, I think from Keith Dreyer, was that we won't know how good all the tools are until they're clinically deployed. And I think it's incumbent on us as a community to understand when something is deployed into clinical practice and is given approval, that we understand at what level it's been tested, because we don't want to stifle innovation, and we don't want to stifle important startup companies that are really essential to this field, but at the same time, we can play our part by auditing the outcomes of those tools if they do go into clinical practice. And I, as I say, I think it's incumbent on, on us as a community to really understand 
what testing has been done on that tool and therefore how can we benefit patient care by auditing, properly auditing in clinical practice and actually publishing that information, being in interaction with the company so that all of these tools can still be developed by innovative startup companies that can get them into the market, but that we're aware at what safety level we're working at and therefore how much supervision we need to provide. Thank you. Any other? I've got another question which is really interesting and I know where it's coming from. Um, what role do you see uh, any of you see for radiomics phantom in terms of repeatability and reproducibility and pitch selection? Um, well, for, for us, phantoms are a must, no? I mean, we need to use phantoms. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be digital phantoms or synthetic phantoms. Yeah. I mean, not only real ones, no? But I really do think uh, we have to check for so many aspects on radiomics and biomarkers with phantoms. But that's not enough. I mean, just with phantoms, we cannot say this is reproducible and this is uh, repeatable um, because we need uh, patients. Sure. And you have a huge amount of variability within patients that have to be taken into consideration. So I do think that's the first step for validation, a must, but not the, the only one. Huh? I think also depends how complicated you want to choose to make those phantoms uh, in terms of representing the, the, the as closer to reality rather than just a very simple phantom. So actually, that sort of phantom work is something with, to collaborate with engineers because the engineer and material scientists have spent their life into looking at different materials, you know, in general. So they will probably have quite a lot of experience on on phantoms. Yes, of course ask a question to the audience. How many people in the audience would be prepared to take part in a clinical trial evaluating uh, an AI tool? Are people prepared to uh, put the work behind that? Yeah, so we should take a picture of that, Evis, on my phone and we'll put it on Twitter. <laughs> Keep your hands up and we'll put that on Twitter. Who in the room is prepared to help validate tools clinically? Have you None got a picture? Of you actually know what oh you're no. getting insulted. Take a bit, wait, you're hold your hands up, we're going to take a picture <laughs> and we're going to put it on Twitter. <laughs> Smile, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> I just regretted not taking a picture when everybody had their hands up who were collecting data sets. So she will, I, this she will my come moment. up to you. <laughs> so it's, why, it's a, a very good tweet here, Anwar. Uh, why are we working in, in image space rather than the raw data space? Do you want to answer that? I, I also have a question. Good. Uh, so um, fr from, from our perspective, at least, we are working on roughly 80 uh, different projects uh, around medical data in general. So imaging and the example that I've given in my talk is just one example of, of the work that we are doing. Um, and of course, it was mentioned already a few times, uh, you, you should not see these projects as in, uh, independent of each other. Uh, there are hopefully more and more uh, relationships that we will find between these projects. So I think what, what the tweet was, was about raw data rather than the image yeah. presets. How would you I mean go to the, no, no, I mean, I think, yeah. It's a question of availability because very few centers will keep the raw data. So that, that's the, the main issue. Yeah. So I this, mean, this, this is, yeah. it's yeah. not available. It's, it well stays in the scanner for about 48 hours, having sort of inquired about that. But it's huge data storage more than, I mean, you can, you can arrange it that it's safe. It's a matter of how do you store that amount of data, but if you do that, that's actually a solution. Yeah. Well, also, you can do that maybe uh, sometimes in some places for prospective studies, Correct. but never for retrospective data. So there is some mathematical work going on on actually how do you sort of go backwards and you know use your deep learning to actually go retrospectively and sort of re reconstruct, go backwards. <laughs> what can I say? Kim is a math sort of hub. <laughs> can I ask you a question? Of course. Can you use the microphone? Okay, in terms of uh, reproducibility, uh -huh. uh, and uh, of course, uh, Bonti was talking about, um, I mean, even the same hospital, same department, each, uh, if we're uh, doing a pancreatic uh, CT, we, we everyday protocols changes. Uh, uh, how on earth, what, how, what are you going to do about standardizing the protocols in the future? I mean, has uh, ASIA has got uh, any, any plan for this? Well, well, I mean, I think, I don't know, I mean, Andrew probably know more, but in our hospitals, our protocols are 
actually standardized? But I think it's, a, it's an excellent it's a question, question yeah. um, because I think if we want to harness AI, we need to uh, come together as a community and have relatively harmonized protocols. Like I said, you want protocols that are harmonized enough that we can harness AI, but that are we know that there's going to be variability that we need to be able to work with. So I totally agree with what you're saying. And uh, one thing that I've been very interested with the myeloma study when I started uh, working on the myeloma study with Christina Messiu is that the myeloma community have really come together and said, these are the sequences that we need. This is what we need to, to diagnose a disease. And so now going forward, already relatively early on in the field, most centers will be using a relatively standardized data set. They've published that in MyRADS, in um, radiology, and I believe in prostate MRI. There's been various uh, publications where the minimal data set, if you like, how we should be imaging some of these are published. And I agree that we need to try and come together. And, and, and actually, it's the coding, it's the naming of all these in the um, RIS systems as well that can allow the identification of the cases. And I think it, that will help us. And it, it actually works backwards, too. If, if you have a application with a clinical proven benefit which works on a specific set of data, the clinicians will actually produce that okay. set of I think it's one more quite interesting, and then we'll have to break for coffee. Um, so recently, an Israeli researcher developed an infected uh, imaging data with a virus to simulate <laughs> lung cancer. What kind of measures are companies provided, um, uh, providing uh, cloud-based models that are taking to mitigate such risks? So how are you protecting us? I'm just looking at <laughs> poor <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> it's the only company. That I don't think I'll make it to Cambridge tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, that is actually a good question. I don't know this particular case, so I will not uh, go into the details of, of, of what happened in Israel. Um, having said that, uh, we are doing, we, we are taking the necessary security measurements, so we are sure uh, that we take uh, things like uh, identification of, of the person and the organization who's sending images to the cloud, uh, the, the, the complete uh, encrypted security channel and so on. We take that really, really serious. So we are doing security audits on, on the software uh, that we are developing. Uh, that is for sure. And that is what we can do, I think. Uh, and that with proper identification where the source is, where the image is coming from, is uh, how it could work. Mm. I mean, I think yes. I mean, I think it's crucial. But you know, that is what the Twitter raise is actually crucial because what happens if you, I mean, you you do all that protection as a company or as a hospital, but then actually your algorithm is messed up rather than actually the quality or the anonymization of the data. So you're not detecting the right abnormality, or I mean, it's something. It's almost yeah, it is difficult. Anyway, on that note, oh, unless it's a burning question because. Uh, we're, we're actually, I think it's almost, uh, we're over the time, I know, but we're over time. I think probably uh, during the coffee break. Thank you. Sorry. One has to make decisions. <laughs>